Hi, I'm Peter Clark, producer of Netline. Welcome to this edition of City Lights Online Employee Video Magazine. Working in the city, it's sometimes amazing that we have anything natural left with all the buildings and industry. Yet there can be some amazing examples of wildlife coexisting all around us. Connie McDougall is going to tell you about a family of osprey which makes its home in the middle of a Seattle industrial area next to the Duwamish substation. We're also going to see how city light workers are finishing a long-term rebuild of our hydro project's turbine runners, saving the utility millions of dollars. And finally, we're going to learn a little about saving money and paper with a quick tip from City Light's service desk. Osprey are becoming more abundant in the lower Duwamish River of Seattle. The birds come to this area to hatch and rear their young. But because much natural habitat has long been destroyed, the birds have adapted their nesting to man-made structures. This young osprey was born in a nest on a platform atop a special pole placed by Seattle City Light a few years ago to discourage nest building on nearby power poles. Ospreys uh, used to nest in, or ospreys natural substrate that they nest in, uh, is typically snags. And as you can see, looking around here, there aren't a lot of snags uh, remaining. The osprey um, always nest at the top of structures. They've essentially learned to nest on these other very stable uh, platforms, uh, power poles and light poles, cell towers, and other man-made structures, um, in the, like I say, in the last 20 years in the Pacific Northwest. James Kaiser is a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Geologic Survey and is studying the effects of the changed environment in the Northwest on the osprey. He works with utilities like Seattle City Light to provide nesting sites that are safe for the big birds, as well as minimizing problems associated with high voltage electricity and potential power outages. The nest material can um, interfere with the electrical components uh, below the cross arms, causing power outages. Of course, the danger of electrocution always exists when birds come in contact with power lines, but Kaiser is looking for another hazard to the birds, pollution. The birds started coming back to the area partly because fish stocks are improving and the raptors need a lot of fish to feed their young nestlings, but the Duwamish also has many man-made toxic materials contaminating the fish that the osprey eat. Part of Kaiser's study is to see just what effect those toxins are having on the top of the aquatic food chain, in this case the young ospreys. With the help of City Light line crews, He's paying a visit to the nest that is located next to a large substation. This is Kaiser's second visit to the nest. Earlier, he took one of three eggs in the nest for chemical evaluation. The uh, sample eggs uh, rep rep represent the contaminant burdens in the female's body. So it's essentially a snapshot of the contaminant uh, levels in her body at the time the egg was formed. The remaining eggs hatched, and now there are two nestlings. Kaiser is going to capture one temporarily to further determine the health of the birds. The parent ospreys are not happy about the visit, swooping down at the bucket as it ascends over 100 feet to the nest. But the birds' attacks are not enough to keep Kaiser from taking a young nestling down for some quick measurements and a blood sample. About uh, 40 days after the eggs have hatched is we collect a blood sample from one of the nestlings and uh, analyze the plasma for the same uh, series of contaminants. We also collect uh, feather samples uh, from the birds and analyze uh, those feathers for mercury uh, concentrations. Osprey usually weigh from two and a half to four and a half pounds at maturity. Their wing spans 56 inches and their claws are sharp for snatching fish from the water. This young female will probably be flying and learning to fish in a day or two after this exam. Northwest osprey migrate to Mexico and Central America during the winter months. This bird will make the trip late this summer and remain south for a couple of years before reaching breeding maturity and then returning to her birthplace. After Kaiser replaced the bird in her nest, she was fed by her father with a fresh English soul. I'm Connie McDougall for Seattle City Light. These guys may look a little like astronauts in their moon suits, and this may look like a centrifuge used in astronaut training. But in reality, 
these are workers finishing up a 20-year effort to replace and improve Seattle City Light's hydroelectric turbines. City Light has spent nearly $64 million in that time, but is expected to get a big net payback of nearly $112 million over the life of the upgraded equipment. Water-powered turbines are the big difference between hydroelectric generation and all other ways of making electricity. Water stored in a higher elevation is directed down onto the blades of the turbine, which then spins the generator that makes the power. The more efficient the turbines, the more electricity produced. The Skagit and other hydro project turbines have been producing power for a long time, some since the 1920s. Almost all of those have now been reworked and improved, and this one at Gorge Powerhouse is the last. Unit 24 has been in operation since the early 1960s and is in the final upgrade planned in this round of work. Yeah, we're hoping to get a nice little jump in efficiency between this and the old one. Plus also, uh, we should be able to run at a higher power with this new one than we did with the old one. We'll use less water to generate the same amount of power. Bob Fuchs is the engineer overseeing the work on the Gorge unit, which includes the new improved turbine runner as well as the repair work on the rest of the generator. It's anticipated this will improve generator 24 from 80 to 100 megawatts. One of the odder jobs is the use of a piece of equipment that requires a machinist to ride round and round, making small adjustments to a cutting edge. It's actually called a boring bar, and what that operation is for is to machine uh, the existing surfaces in the uh, turbine area for, to accommodate some of the new parts that we're going to be putting in the, into Unit 24. This device is an innovation by City Light machinists who are doing much of the work in the turbine rebuilds. Uh, we have a lot of old machinery that needs a constant tender loving care to keep it going. Uh, a lot of the parts were made back in the early 20s and no longer available. So we will reverse engineer what's broken and upgrade it and make it to today's standards in our shop. That has given a lot of expertise to City Lights machinists who must make spare parts for the older equipment. That also gave them a leg up in the competition to rebuild the utility's 18 turbine runners during the latest upgrade. Although some specialty jobs are being done by outside contractors, the bulk of the rebuilds are performed by City Light workers who bid against companies from around the world. We came out about a half million dollars lower than the next lowest competitor. That was competing throughout the world even as far as China had bid on it. So uh, all the equipment that we have at the shop uh, uh, we've collected through the years has allowed us to compete with the outside world. McConnell says the work should be wrapped up by this fall. We know the system. We work well with the other crews that are here already. And the main thing is we're concerned about the quality that we're going to be here, the machine's going to be here, and when we leave, we want it to be the best it can be and hopefully run another 50 years without any problems. Peter Clark, reporting for Seattle City Light. Hi, I'm Sue Copeland from City Light's service desk with a paper cuts tip. Printing on both sides of a sheet of paper is a great way to use less paper on an everyday level. It starts with having a printer with a duplexing unit, and the vast majority of City Light's printers fall into that category. Basically, if you want to save paper but just don't know how, then I'd like to give you some tips on how to make the most of these printers. First, make printing on both sides your default for every printer that you use regularly. Clicking on Start button, then Settings, then Printers and Faxes folder can provide a quick check. Right click on a printer, list it in the folder, and choose properties. Here you may see a tab called configure and under paper handling options be able to select duplexing unit. Click OK. That's a good beginning for most of you so hold on while I explain what some people will see on other printers. Some of the printers will show another set of tabs in properties. If configure isn't an option you will need to click on the tab Device Settings. Scroll down until you see Installable Options and select Duplex Unit. If it has not installed to the right, then drop down and select Installed. Click OK. 
All right, the first step is finished, and you've told your print setup that your printer has two-sided capabilities. You are still looking at your list of folders, so right-click again on that same printer, and this time choose Printing Preferences. Under one of the tabs, either Layout or Finishing, there will be a chance to select Print on both sides. Once this is done, all of your print jobs will automatically print on the front and the back. Okay, that being said, sometimes people need certain print jobs to print on only one side of the sheet of paper. No problem. We'll just deselect the two-sided option for that one occasion. Let me be clear. The deselection will not change the fact that you've got that printer defaulted to the paper-saving double-sided printing. To make an exception to the default rule when you are in an application and ready to print, click on File, Print, and choose Properties. See the print on both sides and deselect it. That job prints out on only one side of the paper, but leaves the printer defaulted to print on both sides. Congratulations. If you find you need help, just call the service desk. Our number is 43766. That's it for this edition of NetLine. This program is put on the in-web every other month. I can also provide you with a CD-ROM of the video. Let me know if you have any story ideas that would be interesting to your fellow employees. You can email me at peter.clark at seattle.gov.